So welcome to the Dementia Researcher podcast, bringing together early career researchers and leaders within the field to discuss their research and share career tips. I'm Dr. Anna Volkma, and co-hosting with me today from the other side of the world, because I'm in Australia today, is Dr. Kamar Amin Ali. Hi, Cam. Why don't you tell our listeners what we're discussing today? Hello, Anna. Today we're joined by special guest, Dr. Carissa Barthelson, to discuss her research on a rare form of dementia that many of our listeners may not have heard of, called San Filippo Syndrome. Hi, Carissa. Hello. Could you introduce yourself and can you also allow me to congratulate you as the newest Race Against Dementia Fellow? Congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I'm about to start the Race Against Dementia, Dementia Australia Fellowship. Um, so I'm based at Flinders University at, um, in Adelaide in South Australia. Um, so yeah, I haven't actually started yet. It should be happening in the next couple of weeks and I'm really keen to get into it. Do you know what? I did my master's at Flinders oh, did University. You really? Oh, fantastic. Did. It's it's a lot. So my PhD was at the University of Adelaide, which is about half an hour down the road. So it's a bit a uh, whole nother world up there, up on a hill by but it seems really not a really beautiful campus. Can't wait to yeah. Yeah, can't wait well, to get started. I only, I only ever went there for my graduation. Oh, really? And what I realised is when I went, because it was remote, they do remote study so beautifully, don't they, in mm, Australia? Mm. And when I went to the campus, I realised how beautiful it is because, and additionally, how many lovely wineries there are yes. around the campus. Yes. Take note. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> As our regular <laughs> listeners will know, however, I am a clinician. So I did that um, master's was a master's of clinical rehab and then I went more into um, research and did more research in the area of dementia but Cam is a fundamental scientist so we're going to come at this from two different ways different angles and um, it feels a bit like mastermind really doesn't it oh boy. And so let's, let's set the scene are you ready to tell us everything you know all right let's do it let's do it <laughs> um, so yeah as Cam mentioned at the start lots of our listeners don't know what this syndrome is and I thought it would be really helpful for you to tell us a bit more about San Filippo, San Filippo syndrome. When are people diagnosed? What causes it? Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, of course. Uh, so San Filippo is a genetic condition uh, and it causes childhood dementia. So it's a really rare disease. So about one in 100,000 children will inherit it. And it's a recessive genetic disorder. So it means that for a child to uh, inherit San Filippo, they have to inherit the faulty uh, gene from each of their parents. And the, the genes in this disease are responsible for breaking down a complex sugar molecule called heparin sulfate. So when the, a child inherits these faulty genes, they can't break down this complex sugar molecule anymore. So it starts progressively building up and clogs up the brain cells. Um, so this causes a cascade of really detrimental events in the brain and eventually is going to lead to dementia and loss of life, typically before they reach 20 years old. Mm. Wow, so it um, has a really significant effect. So does it also affect cognitive domains like memory, speech and language in the same way some other dementia types do? Yeah, so uh, these kids, they generally develop pretty normally until they're about two or three years old. And so about the time they start learning simple sentences, everything's going normally. Um, but then it's after that's when the, the cognitive things start to occur. So, and this is where the, the commonalities with the adult onset dementia seem to start appearing. So these kids will start showing problems with attention, memory loss, confusion, aggression, irritability, uh, problems with sleep, then they start to lose their newly learned language skills. So yeah, there's a lot of going on and I could go on for ages, but yeah, these are really highly reminiscent of what happens in adult onset dementia like Alzheimer's. That's really helpful. Thank you. Mm. So you were talking about um, the, the, the genetic co component. It must be really devastating to families who do actually find out their child has this di diagnosis. Does it have I mean, it sounds like it does. It must have implications for other family members. Oh, yeah. I don't, devastating doesn't even begin to describe it. Um, it's really, really difficult for the whole family. So I have been fortunate enough to um, interact with a few families who have kids with San Filippo. And the, 
the parents have to deal with so many things and it puts them under a lot of pressure. Like um, they can't communicate as clearly with their child as uh, one normally would. So that makes them feel really helpless when they can't understand what their child wants. So yeah, this kind of pressure like, is quite unimaginable really. Um, they also have to be really vigilant. Like with, uh, they need to be constantly watching their child for their well-being as well as the safety of others. Um, so there's a few stories, like playground stories, that I've been told. Um, so one child who had San Filippo, she just didn't have any sense of safety. So um, she jumped off a playground structure onto a concrete floor and actually ended up in the emergency room. And the mum was just devastated as she just felt like a really awful parent, even though it's not really her fault. And yeah, there's another story I've heard when um, there was another child who he was really excited to go down one of the slides. And in, in his excitement, he had actually uh, shoved another kid down the slide and he ended up getting reported. But he didn't push the kid because he was angry. He pushed him because he was excited. Um, so yeah, these behavioural problems which happen because of San Felipe has really big impacts, not only on the child, their parents, but also other people. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah. I can see that they're social circles being a parent I know that how complicated that can be mm. like negotiating those social circles mm. and then if your child has got this diagnosis it must be yeah even more difficult god my goodness yeah it's yeah it's pretty full-on and I also feel for the siblings like the unaffected siblings who um of kids who have San Filippo is like they may not always get the attention that they they need or deserve. And actually the whole family gets affected as there's a lot of sleep problems in San Filippo. So that kind of keeps the whole household up. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that the parents need to deal with. And, yeah, the stress and heartbreak when there's no cure for this disease really extends out quite widely in their circles. Yeah, I, I hear you. Mm. I, I've... Um... I've personally met somebody with Neiman Pick type C, which I think is one of the other main types of you know, childhood or early adult on her onset dementia. And I've certainly seen and observed that in their family dynamic. It, it just such a, um, such a difficult thing, almost unimaginable thing to live with. Um, but I wondered with that in mind, are these two syndromes similar? So Neiman Pick type C and um, San Filippo. So would your research therefore have relevance to this other type of childhood dementia syndrome? Yeah, yeah, definitely. There's definitely some similarities between San Filippo and Neiman, Neiman Pick type C. So a lot of the childhood dementias are what's known as lysosomal storage disorders. So there's about 70 different types of lysosomal storage disorders, and they're all because someone has been born without a functioning copy of a particular lysosomal enzyme. Um, so when you don't have the functioning copies of the enzymes, they can't break down the specific molecule they're supposed to, and it means that that particular molecule starts building up within the lysosome. Hence, or and so it's kind of referred to as they're inappropriately stored in the lysosome, therefore lysosomal storage disorder. So in San Filippo, the molecule that builds up is the complex sugar molecule heparin sulfate. But in Neiman Pick, uh, the molecules that build up are cholesterols and fats. So the, while the, the primary causes are different in the lysosomal storage disorders, I think that the secondary effects are similar. And that's what I want to target, because I think that this could have really widespread benefits for all types of childhood dementia. Uh, but I do want to note, though, that it may not be a cure, because I just want to find something that at least helps and slows down the decline, as um, this could be so important to the families, giving them some extra precious years with the child that they love so much. Mm. That makes so much sense. Thank you. I'm going to hand over to Cam now, back to the other side of the world. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Um, so now we know a little bit more about the disease and its impact as well. I've been dying to get into more of the science of, of this area. So in my research, um, I focus a lot more on um, studying the pathology of different neurodegenerative diseases that lead to dementia. And we know that dementia is something that we would typically associate with getting older, with age being you know, the most significant risk factor for diseases like Alzheimer's that lead to dementia. With um, San Filippo syndrome, it's known as one of the more common forms of childhood dementia. So this might be the first time that many of our listeners have, have actually heard that childhood dementias exist. So what I want to ask you, uh, Carissa, is 
are there similar changes in brain pathology to what we see in adults who have dementia to the children that have San Filippo syndrome? So for example, do they do they have brain atrophy? Do they um, have a certain buildup of proteins in the brain? What what is these pathology changes like with this condition? I think it's a bit of a common hallmark for all neurodegenerative diseases that there's buildup of proteins. So like in Alzheimer's, there's amyloid and tau buildup. A motor neuron has aggregates of SOD1. Um, and yeah, in San Felipe, like I've said, we get accumulation of the heparin sulfate molecule. And I think that the, the process of proteins building up inappropriately in brain cells um, is yeah a common hallmark of all types of dementia. And yeah, these buildups are clogging up brain cells so they can't work properly. Like uh, brain cells now can't get rid of waste as efficiently. And this also um, leads to brain cells not being able to make as much energy as they need to. And I think that energy production is probably the most important part of cell biology of dementia. Because if our brain cells can't make enough energy, this means they can't do any of their other functions as efficiently. Um, So this will be eventually leading to the brain cells dying, and we can see this clinically as atrophy or the shrinkage of the brain. Um, So, yeah, there's definitely some similarities between adult and childhood onset dementia. And, yeah, like I mentioned earlier, the primary causes may be different, but how the brain cells respond, I think, to these causes are going to be pretty similar. So is the energy production the kind of the mechanistic... um... focus of your research that you know is then leading to the development of these pathologies is that what you're going to be focusing on as a potential mechanistic reason for the build-up of these pathologies it's all kind of related so my research is going to be focusing on what's called the endolysosomal pathway of the cell which is like the little trafficking system where cells will bring in its nutrients get it to where it needs to go and one of the things that Uh, this pathway is responsible for bringing in glucose into the cell to generate ATP for the cell to make and to fuel all its other processes. So yeah, this whole network of processes is what I'm really interested in and seeing whether I can develop some therapeutics to see if I can correct any of these processes. That's really interesting because often we've seen the use of animal models uh, to to kind of interrogate these uh, mechanisms. And we've seen how um, over the years that mouse models of disease like Alzheimer's have been used to try and understand what these mechanisms are and then develop these new therapeutics. But we know that specifically with Alzheimer's disease, these models have not been successful in, in then translating to treatments that have either significantly prevented or slowed down progression of the disease. So this might be in part because these mouse models fail to fully replicate the disease that we see in humans and they often only model certain aspects of the disease. So what I find really interesting about your research is that you've used zebrafish as a model organism and I guess many of our listeners, um, they're probably less familiar with zebrafish um, as a model organism, more familiar with uh, mouse models for example. Um, Can you tell us a little bit about how zebrafish might have advantages over using mouse models, um, which is something that have been used for many, many years? Yeah, that's a great, great question. Um, Yes, my whole PhD was about using zebrafish as a model organism to understand the the early changes which happen in the brain, which eventually would lead to Alzheimer's many decades later. So my, my approach was a bit different to what's normally done in using like the mouse models of Alzheimer's. So the current state of play with mouse models of Alzheimer's disease that they're very they're very highly genetically modified so I think the idea was they originally made a mouse model that had a single mutation which would cause Alzheimer's in humans but when they looked at this mouse model and the effects of this mutation it didn't really seem to be doing much they didn't see any any brain pathologies that was consistent with the human disease and they didn't really show many um, behavioral phenotypes So the idea was that they kept adding more and more mutant genes into these mice until they showed the brain changes consistent that happened in the human disease. And ideally when the mice were pretty young so that research could get done fairly quickly. Um, So I personally don't agree with that strategy. While it may be useful for certain aspects of the disease, I don't think it's really replicating what's happening in the human disease. So our approach was to go back to the start where we introduce a single mutation that would have caused Alzheimer's in humans and we were doing it in zebrafish. Um, So our zebrafish, our lab made a a little collection of 
seven different mutations which cause Alzheimer's in humans, and we introduced them into the zebrafish. And then we've been analyzing the, we analyzed the effects of these mutations in the brain and when the fish were very young. And the idea is we were looking for what each of these different mutations did in common. And um, these early common changes could be the, the, uh, the earliest change, which eventually would lead to Alzheimer's disease many decades later. Um, so to cut a long story short, we found the effect in common looks like it was changes to energy production in the brain. And my PhD lab's now going to go on um, and find out exactly what's going wrong in those brains. Um, but why we use zebrafish? Um, one of the most attractive things is that they are so much cheaper than mice uh, to look after. So I'll give you an example, uh, a behavioural experiment we did in zebrafish. Um, we raised a family of 100 sibling fish until they were six months of age. So our Zebrafish facility is completely self-run. We don't pay for tank space or anything like that. We just feed them twice a day and clean their tanks when they get dirty. So I'd estimate that that would cost about less than 100 Australian dollars for a raise these fish until they were six months age. Uh, when we do a similar experiment in mice, um, we needed to raise that many mice until they were six months of age. And we need to do that across multiple cages. Um, and these mice cost about $15 a cage a week. So once we factored in that, plus all the other things we needed to pay for, it was about $16,000 for one experiment. So compared to the $100 for zebrafish, this is a huge, huge benefit. And one kind of related to that is, yeah, the fact that we can get 100 siblings quite routinely from a single pair mating event with zebrafish, and we can raise all of these siblings in the same tank. So we eliminate any genetic and environmental, well, we minimize any genetic and environmental noise. And this is something you can't really do in mice, which kind of only generate maybe 10 mice in a single litter. So yeah, I think the, that's the, the main benefit of zebrafish is their breeding capacity and how you can eliminate all other sources of noise and you can really focus on your effective mutation. I feel like a lot of um, people that have maybe used mice in their research previously are, are exploring using zebrafish as a mo model organism because it's not just kind of the financial benefits of using zebrafish, it's also the ethical ones as well. They've been used in developmental um, biology a lot and a lot of the experiments can be done before they become legally protected. And Mm -hmm. I think even if at some point down the experimental pipeline, if they, if mice have to be used to test a drug for regulatory reasons, at least we can eliminate a lot of the use of mice in kind of those earlier stages with, with something like zebrafish or, or other, other organisms. So that's really interesting to see how you've applied that in your research. Um, so if you said, um, your research previously used zebrafish to understand those early cellular and molecular changes in inherited forms of Alzheimer's disease. And now what you're going to do, if, if, I'm, if I'm right, is to be looking at whether there is a common pathological basis between these forms of Alzheimer's disease and San Filippo childhood dementia. So what can you tell us about your plans for this project over the next three years? Yes, I think you kind of touched on what my, my plan is here. So I'm going to be testing three new repurposed drugs um, to see whether they have any therapeutic benefit in models of these two diseases. So my first step is going to be screening these drugs in um, human patient-derived cell lines. So I'm going to add the drugs to the cell lines and see whether they can rescue any of the differences that we know happens in these cell lines. And but while cells in a dish are pretty useful, it's not really representative of what's happening in a living organism. So that's where my zebrafish are going to come in. I'm going to see whether any of these drugs can rescue any behavioral defects that the San Filippo model fish show. And then the best out of the three are going to be tested in the San Filippo mouse model, as we want to see whether the drugs are translatable to a mammalian system. Zebrafish aren't mammals, so that's really important to show as well. We, we know that often, you know, research doesn't work how we plan. We have to change things as we go along in a project. Um, or sometimes we find things that are really interesting and we decide to pursue those things. But if it does all work out in this project as you've planned and you do manage to find a common pathological basis between Alzheimer's disease and San Filippo syndrome, and you do manage to identify these potential treatment targets, what will the next step be? Have you got kind of a long term plan post this fellowship of where you see your research going? 
Yeah, definitely. So my next steps will be uh, doing a few more animal model testings. I will only be testing it in a um, San Filippo model mouse. We need to make sure that it works in an al on the Alzheimer's side too in like a mammalian system. And then I want to extend it out to other types of neurodegenerative diseases and so including other adult and childhood onset dementias. And yeah, my grand plan is to eventually see a clinical trial with one of these with one of these therapeutics that involve a cohort of that will have a wider patient benefit rather than just going straight for Alzheimer's or straight for San Felipe. I would like to see a cohort that includes both. So do you think this will have implications for sporadic forms of Alzheimer's disease? Because obviously that's the, the most common type of Alzheimer's disease. Um, so do you see it kind of having applications and implications there as well? It's been something I've been thinking about a lot because there isn't really a good animal model of sporadic Alzheimer's disease. So I'm hoping that by the time I get to that pet stage, something's going to be out there that I can test preclinically any drugs that um, I come up with. Yeah, I think that's the that's the challenge, isn't it, for anyone kind of working mm. in preclinical research, especially in you know in the mm. dementia field. Thanks, Carissa. Mm. Thank you, because you've actually in that explanation you've made it so clear. I think a lot of the preclinical research is really difficult to understand for the people we work with and some clinicians. And I just really enjoyed your description of how um, cells work and use energy and that consequently results in cell death because I think that's one of the hardest concepts for the for the patients that I see to really grasp um, and of course also you know this disease is so complex it's also hard for a lot of our funders to grasp so um, before we wrap up today we should probably talk a little bit about your funders race against dementia and we had a couple of questions about this I guess so both um, Cam and myself are early career researchers, so we're probably also a bit obsessed with getting fellowships <laughs> ourselves. <laughs> and you're, you're what now, two years post-PhD? Uh, one year. I haven't actually graduated yet. I've, yeah, all the paperwork's been signed off now, just waiting for the graduation ceremony next month. Has it been delayed because of COVID? Oh, I think just the time that I submitted, I missed last year's graduation okay. rounds. But that's okay. Yeah. I was, yeah, I got the doctor title, so I'm happy now. <laughs> that's the main thing yeah yeah, yeah. and they, they're all delayed in the UK actually so I just had mine two years after I oh my goodness <laughs> but, but this award the, the race against dementia award must have come along then at the perfect time for you it, it the stars really align with me for this fellowship so race against dementia had a fellowship round in 2020 and I was still in the late stages of my PhD and wasn't quite ready to apply for it yet but as a long-time fan of Formula One, I was really devastated that I may have missed out on applying for it back then. But then, yeah, they did the second round in 2021, so that's the one I applied for. And I was still trying to write up my thesis at the same time as get this fellowship application in. So it was like it was a lot of work, a lot of sleepless nights and trying to jump between a thesis writing and trying to think about my next steps as well. It was a lot of work. Um but yeah, I guess it paid. I think, yeah, I was about version 10 on both sides by the time I was ready to submit both of them. So, yeah, it was a crazy, crazy time in my life. Absolutely. Yeah. And I guess in some ways I was just thinking about writing my thesis as well. And I was thinking, actually, although it sounds really intense and a lot of work, it probably kind of complemented each other that you in that writing can be so challenging, can't mm. it? Yeah, that makes so much sense. Um, Cam, did you have a couple of questions as well? around? Yeah. This? So how much support did you have when you were writing your fellowship application? So did you have support from your current PhD supervisor, the university more widely? How, how much support did you have and did you find the support really helped you? Oh, I had a lot of support. So yeah, my, my current my PhD supervisor had a lot of input onto this fellowship application and I'm so grateful to him for all the work he put in for me to move on which yeah, I thought it was quite selfless of him. He went through a lot of drafts with me and helped me shape the application, even though he's not probably going to play a big role in that, in the current work. Then I also had a lot of support from my next mentors. I have three. I have two scientists, one that's a world leader in San Filippo syndrome, and then one that's the, a world leader in Alzheimer's disease. And I also have a clinician as well. So they, their very diverse knowledge of their together, like, Together, they have quite a broad knowledge where um, to really help me um, generate like the perfect application. 
I also had some support from the main charity in Australia that supports San Filippo syndrome. Um, so I reached out to them to get their advice on what would be really impactful for patients. And yeah, their thing was that therapeutic, it has to be a therapeutic based application. That's what we're all here for at the end of the day. And so they, yeah, they were a massive help and they actually helped me set up a little public advisory group with myself and three parents of um, kids who have San Filippo. So I actually get part of the application process. I did a little presentation to them, explained what I was planning to do and they helped me write some of the lay summaries and stuff in within the application. So that that to me was the, the biggest source, um, source of support during this application process, like having the motivation from them and doing this together with them, I think is so important. And I guess, yeah, the last source of support was my my other half. He definitely was there to help me through every step of the way. And he, yeah, feeding me lots of coffee and Red Bull to get me through it. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like for a successful application, like you really need that support from lots of different areas, not just oh, you like definitely do. from the scientific part of it, but also from, like you said, just writing the lay summaries and trying to get that right. So, and, and actually making sure that each different aspects of the application have the same amount of attention and and focus on them because i think sometimes we can easily fall into the trap of focusing too much on the scientific side of the application and the lay summary is something that kind of just gets written maybe at the end as a summary of everything that we've written but that is actually a really really important part of the application and it's great that you kind of sought advice on that part as well it, to be honest, I think it's the most important part of the applications. At the end of the day, the funders aren't just scientists. There's scientists and mm. people like the general public that need to understand what you're doing and understand why it's important. Yeah, and I think actually it pays off because you speak, I'm coming back to this point, I'm circling back to the way you've spoken about this because obviously having spoken to so many people with it, with lived experience, the way you speak about it is so clear and accessible about this very complex task and that's going to bode well for you in terms of impact and dissemination into the future, won't it? I, I was also going to make this point that about your um, your PhD supervisor spending so much time with you, and I think that gets forgotten, is this pay it forward culture. It's so valuable. I realised, I don't think, well, I've realised now that I didn't realise how important it was that, you know, you people pay, help you, you pay it forward to the people you're supporting, and that's how the wheel can keep turning unless we do that unless we're generous with our time i i'm not sure that research develops in the right way that it needs to for for, pe for people no you're absolutely right that's like you're probably one of my favorite parts of the job is pay the paying it forward aspect when you're helping out the students and you sit watch them flourish and develop so it's the one of the most rewarding things about the job yeah agreed <laughs> Yeah, definitely. So, so Carissa, do you have any other tips that you might give to ECRs who, who are maybe looking to apply for fellowships and, and they're in the process of trying to put together an application? Yeah, I guess uh, the biggest thing I would say, and it's a lesson that I've learned, is start early. I probably, if, it was, if I were to do this again, I would have started even earlier than what I did because you'll go through so many versions and things start coming up, trying to get feedback from lots of different people and trying to incorporate it all it, it takes it takes a lot of time and yeah to try and minimize the amount of stress it gets when you get towards the deadline start early and the other thing I would like mention it's got to be your own work and ideas uh, I've seen other people before where they have just written a proposal that it's been their supervisor's idea and if your heart's not in it you're, it's not going to come out when you're writing it it has to be your own ideas and you you have to be excited about it for it to really to really shine and and I think it really shows how passionate you are Carissa and and that's the key isn't it to be you need to be passionate about it for the people but also to keep doing the research in this field um, but for more information on Carissa and her bio and um, how passionate she is about this topic as well as information on race against dementia and dementia Australia you can have a look at their websites. You'll find the links in our show notes. Um, we also have interviews and webinars with some of the other RAD fellows discussing their approach to applying for fellowships as well. And also what makes Race Against Dementia and Sir Jackie's mission so special. But it's time to finish up today, sadly. Um, it's been so lovely talking to you all. We'll be back again in two weeks time. So have a really great week and we'll see you all next time.
Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.